Hoff. Welcome to the Femsplainers. I'm Christina Hoff Summers. And I'm Danielle Crittenden. <laughs> and we have a kind of special episode today because it's just been a season of live events for us. And this, uh, this week we did uh, an event in the uh, auditorium of the American Enterprise Institute in downtown Washington, D.C., where we record. And you did this event with your um, a co-author and colleague, Dr. Sally Sattel, who's a specialist on addiction. She's a ther- well, She's a psychiatrist. She's a psychiatrist. specialist on addiction. She's pro-vaping. Yeah. She And, yeah, as you say, my co-author. We wrote One Nation Under Therapy. But you, you said I did the event. You were there. Yeah, no, I, I, I meant we've been doing a lot of it. Yes, we were no, on you stage. You see, I'm just going to tell you that I don't think your memory has improved <laughs> since you stopped drinking. <laughs> okay, but I just want to say that I'm not the one who brought in, is that Harvey's Bristol Cream? I mean, I agree. I should start drinking if only to bring start bringing in better quality booze because that was my... Role. I just didn't know what to reduced- bring. I had an open bottle of wine, but then this you ha- this has a screw, Harvey's Bristol screw, and, and I like it. But that's like from the 1970s. That's what you would keep, like, like it's you what know, I your drank. Jewish it's- parents would cle- keep over their refrigerator. It was my high school drink. And, yeah, because it's like, a, what, a gateway alcohol. You drink <laughs> it when you're... It has 12. a lower alcohol content. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you brought in, you brought in food. I you brought, brought in a- an enchilada. 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 Encha- <laughs> Encha- it, it looks disgusting. You ate it. it. it no, I, it I brought like, in it. It was from Rosa Mexicana. I disgusting. starved during this podcast. Like, the, the bag, it looks like a dog poo bag. It looks like something you've picked up Izzy's mess. That's a terrible you're thing to fa- say. Christina, you're just falling apart. Can I just say you're falling apart and we have to get you back on We have to get you back. And me on drinking. Poops. But I, I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Uh, well, anyway, you 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 wrote this book, One um, Nation Under Therapy. The thing about our book, it was way ahead of its time, and I would urge listeners to go like Google um, John Stewart comedy. Was it Comedy Central? Yeah, it was on Comedy Central. It was the John Stewart. The John Stewart. Uh, what was it called? The yeah. Daily. The Daily. The Daily. What was it? Right. Uh, Christina Hoff Summers. And I was there to tell him about our book because we were talking about this emerging culture of fragility where we were pathologizing among, among children and yes schools. yes yeah. especially schools right pathologizing everyday life in the school and these these very aggressive self-esteem programs and treating children as if they were fragile little flowers in the first hint of disapproval and i was trying to tell him that you know like the big pen company wasn't selling red pens anymore because I don't know, schools of education had warned teachers that red pens and marks was, on was a paper traumatizing. was traumatizing. <laughs> and he said to me, you know, I told him they use they prefer lavender. He said, and he he was sort of laughing. He said, well, do they put potpourri on the papers too, you know? Yeah. And he was, I was trying to warn him. And it's fun this to watch. This was in 2005. Yes. Like we, I just rewatched it, you know, in anticipation of speaking to Sally too. And it really was pressing. I mean, you were telling John Stewart for the first time, like he'd never heard it, that you know they'd stop keeping score in base, base, baseball. His baseball game. You couldn't play dodgeball because couldn't play dodgeball. You couldn't get... play tag. They had circles of friends instead. No this, one and, was ever out. And the audience was laughing, and he was like, he he was disbelieving you. And then you said, yeah, but now there's a what was the Girl Guide badge you could get? Yeah, he said, well, this isn't mainstream. And I said, you know, the girl. Girl Scouts now give out a, a, a stress badge, and you, you can earn this badge. Or an anti-stress, anti-stress badge. Anti-stress yeah. badge, and you can earn it by, you know, uh, doing events with foot massages and aromatherapy and a feelings journal. Which now might create a Me Too moment if you gave a foot massage. <laughs> <laughs> but no, at that point, he just tore up his card. So, so it's really interesting. No, you were, you were a, you know... Uh, a fortune teller. You saw what was coming. We saw it coming, and, and no one believed us. And, and we now, got, then, then the New York Times acted like, "Oh, this is just, you know, an invented problem." No, it's not. <laughs> we predicted <laughs> snowflakery and safe spaces and trigger, and trigger warnings. We didn't have the names. But then, uh, before we get to our event with Sally, recently also you did another event, but you did it without me. I know. I was I'm, a little. 
triggered. I missed my co-spainer. Tell us about the event you did. Well, it's a, a great group that everyone should check out called We the Internet. And it's bipartisan. They make films. They have comedians. They do events. And they are focused on protecting freedom of expression and free speech, you know, and teaching people about the First Amendment. And we had a very good that, discussion. That doesn't sound like a barrel lot. of laughs. <laughs> well, the comedian was funny. And actually, we it, it was interesting because we talked about hate speech. Because if you ask lots of people, do you think that we should ban hate speech? Do you think the First Amendment protects hate speech? Which it does. Because it just turns out it's very hard to define. And when you, no one's been able to do it. Schools have been trying. And, you know, all of us would like the world to be more polite and gracious. But sometimes the truth isn't polite. And sometimes you have parodies and you have, you know, satire. And so if you write a rule against even something we would all agree, you know, no more, you know, d- disparaging epithets, you know, racial epithets or religious epithets. We would all agree with that, except that, well, except, you know, maybe in a in a play or if you're reading them in a book or if you're trying to be funny with your friend. And what happens is you end up, it just ends up, people have not been able to come up with a definition. So the Supreme Court justices over the years, I mean, it was it's been evolving, but take something like the Westboro Baptist Church, you know, just saying Hateful things. Hateful, hateful. We would all and and and, and uh, <laughs> insulting everyone. The Supreme Court came down on their side because it was a form. It was a viewpoint. Yeah. And we don't have a ministry of truth. We do not want. None of us really, as um, you know, Americans. Maybe you as Canadians do, but Americans don't want to have a body of people. The true who, north. The, the true, true north. <laughs> who can tell us what <laughs> we can't say? North. Now it's not that we don't want to fight hate speech. We all agreed we did. It's just censorship is not the best way to fight it. There also, are other ways. Also, the minute you start to deconstruct a joke, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's really bad. It's no longer funny. Well, the Sally is going to talk to us. She spent 11 months in a corner, southeast corner, I believe, of Ohio in the Appalachians, um, studying, the you know, at ground zero, basically, uh, of the opioid crisis. And we're going to go to her and play you the recording from our event, which was a lot of fun. And next week will be Thanksgiving, and we have another great guest. And if anybody wants to send us Thanksgiving... Oh, yeah. We had, like, what's the... Wh- family meltdown stories. And yeah. I'm going to have my annual Thanksgiving, post-Thanksgiving um, debate with with Kvetch. Hamler Kvetch, Summers. Really. Like, family, you know. On his podcast. You're now promoting. Okay, fine. Promote very bad Hamler. wizards. Very bad wizards. You know, we promote them sometimes. They never promote yeah, us. Yeah, I think maybe you should bring this up. Uh, well, I'm bringing it up. But Thanksgiving. But I do promote another Canadian podcast, Two Philosophers, Four Beers. Yes. And then met those guys. We, we met like those guys. Yeah, because they came. We, we Canada, saw them, but yeah. never the very bad wizards. Would, would, would they did the philosophers promote us? Yeah, he talked about. They talked about us. Okay, good. Well, then we'll promote them. But um, yeah, no, and and we'll have one more podcast just before Thanksgiving. We'll go on a bit of a break. And yes, we out on our social, we have put out a call for the awkward conversations you are not looking forward to on Thanksgiving. Maybe you could give a few few pointers on how you think you're going to uh, get through them. And as always, um, I fear all my children are having that conversation. Right <laughs> Mom's let's, coming. Let's not talk about you know the 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 the, the what, Christina? The what? Oh, I don't want to say it. I don't want to say it. I don't want to. No, no, not Twitter. I did talk a little bit too much about the, the that failed study, the blind audition. Oh study. no, 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 no! We got a uh, th- the blind audition study. Gamergate, Gamergate, <laughs> I'm going to take away that Harvey I want to. I want to have a whole Gamergate episode of the Fem oh, Well, so I think there are some listeners who would agree with you. But If you want, want a Gamergate... Just, just, just okay, send. if you want to Gamergate this before we go to Sally, uh, if you want to Gamergate, you know, maybe if you supported us on Patreon, we might be more responsive to your needs. In fact, we might even have a special... 
Patreon Gamergate Ooh. episode, or maybe and with Harvey Bristol's cream, <laughs> Harvey I'm sure. Bristol cream. <laughs> uh, anyway, yes, please, please support us. Every podcast, it's so wonderful. We get a few more patrons. We're still not meeting our costs. If you want to stop Christina from having to drink something like Harvey Wallbanger. I'm at Harvey Wallbanger. She's at Harvey Wallbanger. I thought they drank this at Oxford. I think of us. I thought it was like... Yeah, and they're all like 18. And exactly. They're actually 87. <laughs> and uh, we really, we really, we really need it. Christina's threatening to quit because she's wondering when this podcast is going to amount to Anything that will support. Well, just because I met a famous podcaster and he was just saying how much, oh, you know, it's so lucrative. It's hard work, but it's worth it. It's so. <laughs> yeah, guys. But we would just be happy if we met our costs. So please, patreon.com backslash femsplainers. And let's now transport you to the auditorium of AEI and listen in on our important discussion with Dr. Sally, Sally Sattel. So, Christina, you know what I'm going to be buying my friends and family as gifts for this holiday? Spoiler alert. Quip toothbrushes. And you know why? Not just because they make a great toothbrush, but because they are so stylish. They're so pretty. I never thought you could have a toothbrush that was just so pretty and sleek, and they come in so many different color combinations. They have matte black, metallic pink, that you'll actually want to keep them out on your bathroom counter. And they start from only $25, dramatically less than other electric toothbrushes. Well, I've told you I love my Quip toothbrush, and it helps me keep up my good brushing habits. Quip's electric brush, it has these very sensitive sonic vibrations with a built-in timer, and 30-second pulses that guide you, you know, while you're brushing. So you can't just, you know, fail to clean your teeth. It forces you to do it. <laughs> and they have this floss dispenser. And the Quip floss dispenser comes with pre-marked string to help you use just enough. Plus, Quip delivers fresh brush heads, floss, and toothpaste refills to your door every three months with free shipping. So... It's just routinized. You can't go wrong. And um, just to go back to its great style, it has this multi-use cover that works as a stand. It mounts to mirrors, and it slides over your bristles to pack and protect your quip on the go. So it makes traveling with an electric toothbrusher easier. Plus, there are no wires or a clunky charger. I hate those. And it runs for three months on a single charge. And if you go to getquip.com, dot com slash femsplain and you go there right now you will get your first refill for free that's your first refill free at getquip.com slash femsplain spelled g-e-t-q-u-i-p dot com slash femsplain and that's to get your first refill free but my question christina is Will it take out the enchilada bits? <laughs> I'm, I'm starving. I brought an enchilada. <laughs> and there are no bits. Welcome to the Femsplainers. I'm Christina Hoff Summers, and I'm very grateful to the American Enterprise Institute for hosting this event at the live Femsplainer. And we are going to speak to my colleague, Dr. Sally Sattel, about the opioid crisis, her views on vaping, and various and other topics. Well, I'm very excited to be here. I'm Danielle Crittenden. Um, and I'm looking, we have a very young audience here in the auditorium. Last time, Christina, we were on a stage together. It was in Nashville at Politicon. And half of the audience were Bernie supporters, and the other half was Trump supporters. So before we start, how many opioid addicts do we have here? <laughs> anyone? 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 <laughs> uh, no, no opioid addicts. Um, we also are doing this show, again, with no alcohol. Ask about vapors. <laughs> 
Oh, that's a good question. How many, how many vape? Oh, it's a clean crowd. <laughs> only two, or only two men, are confessing. Only two confess, yeah. but I've seen others. Yeah. <laughs> but never mind, moving on. Um, but yes, we're doing this really with no stimulants of any kind except coffee. Um, but anyway, welcome. Welcome to Sally. Oh, thank you so much. And, uh, oh, just one other note. Um, my friend, Andy No is here, who is an editor and writer at the New Millennial, and he's an expert on Antifa. And if there are any Antifa members in the audience who are going to act up in some way, Andy's here, he's an expert, he's got his camera, so... And he's ready to throw himself in front of your punches. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but anyway, why don't you introduce Dr. Sattel? Dr. Sally Sattel is a practicing psychiatrist and lecturer at Yale University School of Medicine, where she examines health policy as well as political trends in medicine. She's the author of numerous books, too many to mention, except One Nation Under Therapy, mm -hmm. which she co-authored with me. Boy, that book was ahead of its time. When I mean, did we, that come out? 2005. Yeah. And we predicted this culture of fragility and snowflakery and all of that. But we weren't taken seriously, except we were right, but never mind that. <laughs> anyway, uh, and she has been, I think we'll start by talking about what you've been doing this last year, where you've been studying the opioid crisis. You went to like ground zero in Irontown, in Ironton, Ironton in in Ohio, mm -hmm. and lived among, uh, you, we actually, in that town, well, tell us about that town. They had 28 people in, in, hospitalized in one day or something? Oh, actually, that was, <clears throat> well, I went to a town, to, to work in a town that was called Ironton, Ohio, and it's in the tri-state region. So that's the southeast corner, and it abuts um, Kentucky and, and West Virginia. So West Virginia is, has the town Huntington. <clears throat> in fact, that's, it's Ashland, Ironton, and Huntington. So those are the three cities in those three states that are in a cluster. And it was, yes, it was Huntington, West Virginia. In 2016, in August, they had 26 overdoses. The 24, 20, I think, 22 of them, I think, were, um, were revived. But that really put it, oops, <laughs> ah, put it on the map. <laughs> And I, I since met the mayor. He's he's really an innovative guy. They've done a lot there. Um, that's a town of about 50,000, and Ironton is a town of about 10,000. And for what it's worth, I lived in Ashland, right across the river, and that's a town of about 20,000. Um, so I ended up in Ironton um, largely because of um, J.D. Vance, because I didn't know for, for, for quite a while. Let me back up a little bit. Um, I mean, the opioid crisis has been... She um, did air quotes, just for It's listeners. not a crisis. Okay. We'll get to that. Okay. Oh, that, you know, that actually wasn't meant to uh, um, undercut the notion <coughs> that it, it, it is a real big problem. It's a significant problem, no question about that. Um, that uh, it, had been, it had been growing since, or I should say overdoses to, to, from opioids, fatal overdoses, had been growing since... Um, Frankly, they've been starting since the mid, early to mid-90s, but, um, but the CDC mostly measures them now from early 2000 or 1999 onward, and, um, but they didn't really capture, if you didn't live in these afflicted places, they really didn't capture the public's imagination, I don't think, till around 2015, and that was during the presidential primary when it, you know, Hillary Clinton and others, um, you know, they'd go to these small towns, Manchester, New Hampshire being notorious because in addition to Appalachia, Northeastern, um, you know, Massachusetts and Maine and, and New Hampshire were also affected heavily. And they went there talk, you know, ready to talk about um, immigration and jobs and all people talked about was pills and heroin. And, um, and in fact, Hillary did, President, the nominee Clinton did respond with a plan. Others talked about a lot. Remember Carly Fiorina talked about her personal experience, I think, with her stepdaughter. Um, so, and, and I think Christie, I mean, everyone really did make mention of it. But th that's, I think that's when it really penetrated public awareness, even though I'd been aware of it since the late 1999 is when OxyContin was sort of dubbed hillbilly heroin. But, um, 
And so every article I would read say, there aren't enough mental health people, there isn't enough help, we don't have people with a waiver, and there's a special waiver that you need in order to prescribe something called buprenorphine or suboxone, which is a treatment for opioid addiction. And I thought, well, I have that, and you know, I can what do the it. heck? <laughs> yeah, I can do it. And uh, so anyway, it took quite a while to find a place, and I almost gave up. But someone said, why don't you ask J.D. Vance? It never occurred. The author of Oh, the elegy, 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 of course, yeah. who comes from those parts and has risen to mm -hmm. great oh, yeah. fame now and wrote his beautiful book based on the people who are so susceptible yeah, now but, to Well, this. his family was one right. of his mom in particular. So, um, yeah, I asked him, and he uh, found me this little town, Ironton, in, in, a, um, in Ohio. And in fact, the person who kind of raised their hand in a meeting when a whole, I think, group of, of social service workers were asked if they'd like to have a psychiatrist for a year, making me the only psychiatrist in the, in the county, uh, which just shows how impoverished so people, they... So people, who could, who could prescribe methadone to them in that town? Or actually, where? they didn't have methadone there, but uh, if you're referring to this suboxone drug, actually... Um, and nurse practitioners oh, they and, and PAs, okay. they, they really do a lot of the heavy lifting in these small places, and I was impressed with them. Um, but anyway, so that was, that was how I found my way there. And uh, in fact, just a little interesting aside, that the person who sort of raised his hand and said, okay, we'll take her, was head of something called a community action organization, which I assumed was just you know, a name for a local coalition, but it turns out it, it actually traces back to the war on poverty, and these were um, one of the earliest programs that were put into the 1964 Economic Opportunity Act. And they were supposed to, there were thousands of them all over the country. And they were supposed to, uh, kind of naive to think they could obliterate poverty, but you know, to, to really focus on that and, and reduce it. And um, unfortunately, uh, the ones that, that were a focus based in inner cities, ended up being co-opted by um, uh, militant forces and, and mil social yeah. justice warriors. And, and then um, LBJ was so disaffected, it just abandoned them. But, it's, but the program still exists, and I think in rural areas really does a lot of good. So that's the group I worked with. But you have a long history, obviously, of working with addiction. That's your specialty. You deal with a methadone clinic here. What made you want to go amongst them? What, as you say, it's been a problem here since the 19... 90s, even though we may just be starting to recognize it. What, what made you sort of want yeah. to do the, um, the full, um, full immersion full, full, full immersion course in, yeah. in opioids? Well, just for that reason, in fact, that it's very, very different. I knew it was very different. I mean, in our methadone clinic, you know, we had the average age in the methadone clinic here, which happened to be near George Washington University, was 57. Yeah. So these folks have been injecting since the Carter administration. You know, a lot of them, they started really young. Baby um, boomers. They call themselves, a lot of them call themselves, we're old school addicts. We started shooting. We didn't start with pills. You know, they were, yeah. um, and, and, uh, you you know, snowflakes. <laughs> very different population, almost exclusively African-American here. Yeah, and, uh, you know, and of yeah. course, traditionally um, more, um, uh, you know, white um, start out with, you know, white uh, folks in, in these distressed areas. Um, and again, as I said, pills, pills didn't play a role in a, a significant role in urban uh, opioid problems, you know, at all. I mean, I had patients who'd take anything you'd give them. You know, they'd buy Xanax outside the clinic and things like that, and probably handfuls of Percocets. But, but that's not what started anything. And, and it is true that, um, that the prescription opioids did play, they did play an instigating role, a pretty big one in, in Appalachia. And mm -hmm. the town I was in, but you would call it more like Rust Belt Appalachia. It wasn't really deep into you know, Eastern Kentucky or, or West Virginia. I mean, close enough, and, and certainly was, was a very troubled place. But. So they started with the pills. How did so many pills get there? Well, it's, it's an interesting story. The, the common narrative um, is that uh, well, OxyContin is very much, is very prominent in, in the time narrative. Release. Yeah, and, and, and it does have a big role. I'm not, I'm not downplaying it. Um, but the, the common narrative is that, you know, they swooped in the drug reps who 
denied that, practically were denying that this drug even had addictive potential. And I suppose there are always dr you know, rogue drug reps, and they, they could misrepresent the drug. Anyway, so OxyContin was always Schedule II. It's, as the name implies, the, the active um, opioid in there is uh, oxycodone, and the contin part comes from the word continuous. So it was um, supposed to be and approved for a 12-hour release, which, of course, is beneficial if you have um, chronic, chronic pain. pain because you'd want um, a steady state for as long as you can maintain it. And infrequent dosing is the best way to get that. If you have to take something every two or four or six hours, you get more peaks and troughs and you want it stable. And the other advantage to OxyContin was it was pure oxycodone. It didn't have uh, Tylenol. Tylenol or acetaminophen, didn't have aspirin. And I mean, if you just have your teeth out and take three days of Percocet, it's not a problem to be exposed. Percocet is oxycontin, excuse me, oxycodone and acetaminophen, and that's fine. And of course, you probably take Tylenol all the time. But years and years of exposure to those, to aspirin and oxycontin can cause, um, you know, for aspirin, it can cause liver damage, even possibly kidney damage. Hearing um, loss? Well, in super high doses. And it is unusual, but it does happen, yeah. And, um, and of course, Tylenol in high, high doses taken all the time is bad for the liver. Um, so, so it had its, its yeah. advantages. To make a very long story short, um, the drug reps did come down there, um, mainly because there was already so much opioid prescribing, because there was so much hard labor going on there, mostly mining work. Um, to some extent, timber. So there was, it was already a tradition of, of prescribing these drugs. And that's how you market something. You go to where there's already you know, a demand for it. And it was um, overprescribed. There's no question about it. It was uh, because it was time release. There was a lot of drug packed into it. The highest dose at one time was 160 milligrams, which has since been discontinued. But the Percocets are 5 and 10 milligrams. This is 160. Wow. If, if we took that, we conceivably could die if we were not mm -hmm. used to that medication. So people chopped it up and snorted it. And these were people who, I have to say, they knew what they were doing. They were probably, um, you know, we know that people, the average person who does develop an addiction to prescription opioids is already at high risk because they've had a previous problem with alcoholism or drug abuse or they're, or they're depressed or going through some sort of existential mm -hmm. um, disarray at the time, which is not uncommon in some of these places. They're very economically um, stressed, and, uh, and they're difficult places. They're isolated. There's, for younger people, there's just a crushing uh, sense of boredom and, and a, you know, a worry that, what is my future? I mean, the, the horizons look very dark for some people. And when you don't see much hope, I mean, it's not that much of a stretch to to understand why people would want to medicate that. Was this hopeless? Did you come away I after did. 11 months and go, no helping these people? Like, what <laughs> mm, was your Well, the was problem is that we're in the third generation now. So the people who started lo losing their jobs started in the, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s in this town. I mean, there are other places where a big anchor industry just moved out overnight, like Janesville, Wisconsin, right. is a classic example. It wasn't like that. It was a very slow um, bleeding of, of industry leaving. And it's kind of ironic because this town, before and, and after the Civil War, up until around World War I, was like a powerhouse of, of um, uh, iron production, actually. Iron Town, Ironton. Um, and, uh, and then with every war, they'd, they'd get another boost in productivity. But then around the 60s, and this is wrapped up with the automotive industry changing. Um, yeah, uh, industry started, started uh, plants started closing down. And so to the extent that you had a relatively intact family that was then kind of derailed because, you know, the dad lost his job and then eh, there's a little more domestic violence at home, uh, a little more drinking, you know, a little more familial dysfunction. But then, you know, when you get several generations down, um, that can be really... You're not talking about something that can necessarily be fixed with a, with a job. I mean, I think economic revitalization is necessary, but maybe not always sufficient for some of these places. So I don't know. I wanted to leave, obviously, I wanted to leave on a somewhat optimistic note. And, and um, let's just say this town, 20% of people pay taxes. Um, 
most kids who succeed and you know do well in high school um, get out. You know, they go to college and they keep going. So anyone who has a chance to pursue a better future is not going to do it there. Um, they might come back. I've met some who are really nostalgic for their. You know, they still. It's still a sense. There's very much a sense of being pulled home in in these places. I mean, when I grew up, I grew up in Queens. Get out! I mean, that was the idea. Just it would be a failure if you stayed home, you know. And um, but uh, there's a very very strong pull. But then again, back to you know people who have you know a promising horizon, they will leave, and and the town then starts to have a hollowed out middle class with older disabled people and younger people. Not all of them, of course, but you know, who are involved with um, the drugs, and as I said, a really bad tax, you know, poor tax base. Um, and a downtown that I'm, I, I've, I was told looked a lot worse, but you can still find some empty storefronts. And then, and then there's this little brigade of heroes, you know. Of, of, well, tell us about them. Well, you know, there's the um, Episcopal um, priest, and you know, I, I am, I don't mind, so I'll say that. I'm, um, an atheist Jew, and which may be redundant, I don't know. Uh, triggering. But, <laughs> but my best friends were, well, I want to say my best friends were highly religious people. Then again, I, I think from the pool of folks I had, everyone was quite religious, and that was really a, um, different. Um, I hadn't really been conscious of, of that um, among uh, friends and, and how prominent it was in their lives and how, how um, apt they were to call their jobs a, a calling, um, but yeah, my two best friends, one was a couple, and they were um, very devout Baptists, and the other was this Protestant minister. Did, or, they, did they try to save you? Well, <laughs> I, went to, I actually went to church more in, I think, a year than I ever went to synagogue. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, uh, um, no, but, but this couple, I mean, they, so I would go to church, and they'd introduce me to people, and they'd say, this is Sally, she's visiting from, and I'd say, I'm an atheist Jew. Because they'd, they'd say, which church do you go yeah. to? And, I, and I'd say, I'm an atheist Jew. That's great! I mean, they were so happy that someone would, now maybe it's because, so you, you know, weren't going to compete with them or something <laughs> well, instead of another church. Maybe they did think that, you know, there was a possibility here. Um, but, but what the, the husband <laughs> of the couple said to me, because he kept giving me books, and I said, you realize I'm really skeptical. And he said, that's all right, at least you're open minded You know, at least you He was so touched by that. Um, and these people really lived it, you know. They, I mean, um, they were devout, and they truly, their life was really informed with, um, you know, what Jesus would do. It was very inspiring, actually. So, um, so there was that, uh, and the, the Protestant, uh, Episcopal, sorry, um, minister, was a wonderful lady, um, 74 years old, but more energetic than I am. And, um, you know, worked with her parishioners all the time and with little, you know, community groups to um, try to keep the kids busy after school and, um, and uh, uh, you know, food banks and this and that. And, and you know, trying to, and then there were business people that was trying to recruit businesses, but it's hard. Um, I mean, it's a town with pretty crumbling infrastructure, so you're not going to find who's going to want to set up a town where you'd have to do so much uh, work that way. Now there is there was, was some hope that maybe a, an aluminum rolling plant would would open up in um, Kentucky, which was right across the river, and that wouldn't change everything, but it would really be helpful. So that's exciting, and maybe that will happen. Um, but it was all these preachers, and a lot of them were kind of non-denominational because um, it, it, it seemed that uh, the churches really weren't maybe that well attended, but at least people did have some appetite for spirituality, so these other kinds of churches were thriving, churches that were just devoted to people with, with drug problems. Um, so, and a guy, I met this wonderful guy who uh, is obsessed with Jonathan Haidt. I, I, when I first met him, <laughs> He, um, Say who Jonathan, Jonathan Haidt is. Jonathan Haidt is. Oh, Jonathan Haidt is um, a social psychologist. Now he's at NYU, but he pretty much pioneered, or, or at least made, did a lot of research in, and really made I mean, famous the idea of moral psychology. And, um, and uh, so this guy, he'd already had his career. He was kind of a plastics, um, worked in pl plastics. 
He took like, the graduate. I'm just going to yeah. say, yeah. Yeah. Plastic. Plastic. <laughs> um, and, and he retired. And for some reason, this man was obsessed with coffee roasting. I don't get it. But he, so he wanted to open his own little cheers downtown yeah. as a gathering place. And he, he opened it while I was, was there. And he, it, was, it was good. You know, they had Friday night, whatever. Um, you know, open mics, this kind of thing. And it really was a bit of a gathering place. Now, again, you just mul try to multiply that by a lot, and hopefully you can get more of a civic infrastructure. But, but Right, but aside from the economic, and I'll move on to vaping yeah. tr after That's this. Okay. But what a I lot wanna... of vaping down there. Oh, oh, yeah. A lot of it. Okay, well, let's... Yeah. Um, a lot of Trump voting? Yes. Um, <laughs> one, of the, one of the questions, or one of the myths that you blow it open, as it were, was that we so fear opioids now as not just this, you know, working class Appalachian problem, which it obviously is, but also that your middle class daughter who plays soccer at her school can get an injury and then suddenly become an addict, um, which we've all heard those stories and read about them. Um, you, you, you say the underlying problem of addiction is that people who are going to get addicted, even the most poster children or poster people for seemingly successful, happy lives, you have to have a disposition, not just to addiction, but there has to be something wrong. And I'm just going to quote something that you wrote that I thought was so beautiful. You said, in fact, the people who become addicts are abusers are rarely new to drugs. Opioids acquire their dark power when they keep souls not just broken shoulders and teeth from throbbing. It's a long journey to get people where they can tolerate their lives without drugs or alcohol. And so what you're seeing, I guess, in this town and towns like it, it's like the whole town is having the dark night of the soul, as it were. As you mentioned, boredom, lack of economics. But what about the predisposition? I mean, I assume there are people there like the coffee roaster or like, you know, and, and the ministers they, they weren't who are, be addicts. Or aren't the addicts. Everything you said, I just want to take it back for a minute to when I talked about all these levels of ex explanatory levels for addiction. And as I said, none of them are mutually exclusive. But one of those levels is reasons. I mean, you never think, when you think of conventional illnesses, you don't say to someone, why did you get cancer? Why did you get, and even if it was smoking, for example, even mm -hmm. if it was smoking, um, that becomes an autonomous physiological process that you can't affect. Um, once, once it's begun, um, you can always try to intervene in your own addiction, either by getting help. In fact, most people do stop on their own. But in any case, the reasons is very important. I mean, when you read any addiction memoir, you can see why, what people are medicating. And, and I've always sort of, and I guess being away um, helped me kind of sharpen this, the distinction between what I might call almost individual level addiction, where there's just to use a sort of a shorthand here, but there's inner turmoil that a person is trying to suppress or soothe in some way, as opposed to communal addiction. And that's where the epidemics come in, mm -hmm. because that's population level. You have to and treat a town where, versus a, a person. Yeah, that's really, I've always called addiction a symptom, and, really. And I prefer how do you to do call that? it a symptom. Like, would you well, see? that's damn hard. <laughs> um, <laughs> More federal program, like, like in a Well, in, in a, you can treat in people. In a nutshell. In, in the conventional sense, you know, you treat them medically. I'd say the most ground zero um, uh, view of, it, of, of addiction is reviving somebody with Narcan. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? That's, that's yeah. the most intense, immediate, urgent kind of response. And then if they're motivated in getting treatment, and if they're motivated is a big deal, because a lot of people, mm -hmm. at least for the first 10 times they overdose, don't want to get help and just hope that you can keep them going each time until we do. But, um, and then there's these medications, methadone, suboxone, then another drug that's not an, those are both, all op both opioids with some abuse potential. Then there's another drug, Vivitrol, this just suppresses craving largely and blocks the effect of the drug. Then you do that. And then, and then, you know, there's what's called cognitive behavioral therapy to help people manage cravings. And, and then it starts getting into vocational care and repairing your life and, um, and then you have two levels of issues for a lot of people. You have, you know, what, what kind of led them to use drugs in the first place, and now that's superimposed by a whole, a whole layer of difficulty that they've 
largely generated so Chris, by being addicted so for Christina, so long. So, Christina, we may need one nation under therapy, sounding like. <laughs> yes, there's any therapist. But, but just before we leave this yeah. issue, so what happened? Now there's awareness about what you saw, or, you know, in great specificity, the nation is aware of the opioid crisis, and the reaction is there's kind of a panic about it. The CDC clamps down, issues uh, warnings to doctors, which were misunderstood, oh, yeah. and the result is oh, yeah, that yeah. I understand that there are people who legitimately need OxyContin. They have chronic pain. They are not going to be addicts. They never were. And they're having a hard time getting it. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. That really is the uh, un one major unintended consequence of um, uh, the, the warranted um, effort to curtail prescribing. Because there's no question that doctors were too free with the 30 days supplies. Mm -hmm. Most people don't even fill them. And those who do don't finish them. And, and a very few become addicted. I mean, some do. And as I said before, there are, you know, there are kind of red flags about that. Uh, but um, in, in terms of whether they have a history of abuse and whether they're going through a, um, where they have a psychiatric problem or just going through extensive ex existential turmoil, which can happen if you're in a terrible accident and you feel it's going to ruin your life. You know, that's how you get those stories of everything was great until my kid mm -hmm. was given a Percocet. And yeah, well, it wasn't, it wasn't the Percocet per se. It's the fact that the Percocet was then given to a, 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 a child who now sees his or her whole life ruined because the, his sporting career is over, or this mm -hmm. poor disfigured girl thinks she'll never get married and have a life, and right. and uh, and it's, they it's he, not dealing with the trauma of the event that's itself. That's exactly right. It's just reacting to the medication. I think that's why so many uh, veterans would you know got in, would get in trouble with drugs as they were treating p PTSD. Yeah, they may have needed it for their injuries, but it was mainly what what be, what became the problematic thread in, in, the, in their. Uh, situation was the post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, but anyway, uh, no question doctors prescribed too much. Remember in the 60s, 70s, 80s, doctors did not take pain um, seriously enough. We were really were under treating pain. And then there was a big pain movement um, to uh, uh, liberalize uh, prescribing. And even for cancer, they weren't treating mm -hmm. pain adequately. And for childbirth, they weren't treating pain. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, and then, uh, OK, long story short, skipping ahead, as we said, pendulum swung too far in the direction of promiscuous prescribing. And I'm not even talking about pill mills, which were flat out criminal enterprises. You know, where you wanted to legalize drugs? Well, we, we did do that. They were called pill mills. And you could just pay cash and walk out with um, bottles of, of opioids and benzos and then sell them for a dollar milligram. And many people did that. I mean, the black market just thrived in that way. Um, but the problem is, with cutting back, it was just too blunt, as, um, you know, just too blunt an instrument. This idea that people should, and the CDC, and to their credit, they really tried to correct this. They had written guidelines in 2016, which I have to say, unlike my feeling about the CDC and vaping, <laughs> they, those guidelines they put out were not bad. They were intended for primary care doctors, and they had to do with you know, how to prescribe opioids for chronic pain. Not acute, you know, not for a broken ankle or something, but you know, for people with severe um, ongoing pain. And, um, and they mentioned something about, I'm paraphrasing here, but basically try not to go over or you know, be cautious about going over 90 morphine milligrams. Of they did not say to take people off their medication, but unfortunately, uh, that it frightened doctors. Scared the heck out of doctors. They were taking, and still are. I get letters every week from people um, who were using their medications responsibly. That was one thing. If you're selling your meds or giving them away or you have your own problem with overuse, that's different. But people who are responsibly using it, who went from you know, being bedridden to at least being able to take care of themselves at home to being bedridden to actually being able to work. I can't tell you how many doctors mm -hmm. have uh, called me, you know, um, so that they could be very high functioning with these medications. For some people, they just, they just need them, and they need them at high doses. And I, I'll concede that when they were first diagnosed with their chronic problem, it's conceivable they could have been treated differently with fewer opioids and other 
um, interventions, or so that maybe they needed no opioids or a, or a lower dose. But the point is, now here they are, a decade, 15 years later, functioning well. Their doctors are scared to death. We did get the C we a, a part of a little group. Um, we did get the CDC to um, actually clarify their. Uh, guidelines, and they wrote us a letter, we put it online, then two weeks later they wrote it in the New England Journal of Medicine, and we were so excited, and we handed that out to everyone, and now the doctors are scared of the DEA, you know, um, and the DEA is not transparent, so you don't know when you're going to come in their crosshairs, and unfortunately the more doctors get afraid, that means the one doctor left in town who's willing to do this sees all the, frankly, difficult people or the people on very high dose opioids, and so there's a, you know, a screaming red sign above his door, and that attracts DEA attention. And it's a real terrible problem. Yeah. Okay, let's take oh. a short break there, come back for vaping. Well, Christina, we've been talking about the onslaught of the holidays, and I'm not worried about what I'm going to get people because I found the place where I'm going to get most of my gifts for you and even Izzy, which is the Grove Collaborative, which is an online marketplace that delivers natural cleaning, beauty, and personal care products directly to our doors. Oh, my goodness. And they make healthy, affordable, effective products, easy and convenient. So... I think by now there are about 500,000 American households that shop Grove for their healthy home essentials, and they carry safe products that are better for the planet and that really work. Yes, and we'll, you'll find brands that you already know and love and that we love, like Mrs. Meyer's 7th Generation. Burt's, Burt's Bees. Bees. I, I love Burt's yes, Bees. The I like, soap, the, yeah. the, 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 the lip, lip moisturizer. Lip oh, my God, it's like the best lip balm, especially in this cold weather. But we know you're busy like we are, and that's why Grove delivers what you need on your schedule. With flexible refill orders, you'll never have to worry about running out of your everyday essentials, and you'll also be saving the planet. There is more microplastic in the ocean than there are stars in the Milky Way. True statistic, Christina, you can't shoot that one down. So <laughs> if you want to start saving the planet and saving yourself time and everything else for a limited time, when listeners go to grove.co slash femsplain, you will get a free five-piece gift set from Mrs. Myers in festive holiday scents like peppermint or Iowa pine, your tables will smell like the holidays. So go to grove.co slash themsplain. That is grove.co slash themsplain. Get this exclusive holiday offer, and I am definitely looking for dog breath mints for Izzy. Her breath is fine. <laughs> There are some pine scented. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna do quickly vaping. Do you guys have questions that we can? Will there, anybody want to ask a quick question? Because I want to make sure we leave time for it. Is there someone? Anyone? Anyone? Okay. Okay. So we'll go to one or two questions that will be short. If you don't have questions, we're just gonna call on you. <laughs> so have something in mind. Okay. So Sally, you also have controversial opinions on vaping as. You know, we know that, that, that aside from the fact that children are all, all over now the flavored e-cigarettes, there are now worries about diseases, um, health risks, and you think these are being overstated, but we're seeing massive recalls of e-cigarettes. Talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll correct you, Danielle. I don't have controversial. I just follow the data on this, and I'm not alone by any means. Thank goodness I'm, I'm part of a woman. Well, maybe you're controversial is no, no. wrong She's word. the factual fentanylist. <laughs> uh, no, you are right. that it, It's sad that it's become a controversy yeah. because there are... Uh, there are data out there. Now, specifically with respect to the people who are uh, developing, uh, you know, pulmonary injury, and maybe 30 or 40 now have died, mm -hmm. um, which of course is tragic. It is, uh, it's now established that 
the people who have become ill and succumbed, we're not using commercial grade nicotine. We're not using e-cigarettes. We're not, I mean, we use the word vaping, which up until a few months ago was always associated with, with e-cigarettes. But, but technically speaking, vaping is, is just a delivery system. It just means you're aerosolizing something and, and taking it and, in. And, and it is so healthier can, than smoking. Than yes, cigarettes. but I'm just saying this is one of the sources of the, the word, yeah. um, confusion is, you know, you can, you can vape just like a glass, a tumbler, you know, is a delivery mechanism. You can drink milk in it or you can drink hydrochloric acid. Or you can vape, mm -hmm. um, you know, commercial grade nicotine or you can vape bootleg, mm -hmm. you know, uh, te tetra THC. Mm -hmm. And that's what was getting people sick. Uh, there was pretty good evidence that that was true back in September and um, the CDC finally made that official, I think over the weekend, it finally conceded, but the FDA. And they found they were adding before, something like vitamin yeah, E acetate. acetate. Well, that thins it out or, or it thickens it, it depending thickens on it. I think which part of the process actually. <laughs> but, it, but it damages the lungs. Oh, yeah, terribly. yeah, well it's so, oil and you yeah. shouldn't inhale oil. Shouldn't but, inhale. There, but there have been a couple of cases, I mean it's also too early to tell in many ways too, right? There have been a couple of cases that have come from uh, smoking regular uh, branded e-cigarettes. There's been at least one that I, I've and read Are you about. talking about the Nebraska case? Uh, I forget where well, they Well, that guy was like, he'd smoke 50 cigarettes a day for, but since he, he'd been 16. No, but was, there was some question that they, that they thought that's why he died, and then they, they unearthed it because they realized, no, this could have been an, a, an effect of an e-cigarette. Uh, but uh, but it's only glass, been with us a short time, right, comparatively oh, vaping. It's been with us at least 10 years, so you would expect to see people dying earlier than this yeah. because this is clearly an acute phenomenon. God forbid it's not a cancer, which does take years to... Right. Um, no, there, there's really no question. And, and that was a, an egregiously misrepresented case, in, in my view. Um, now, I, I wouldn't... It is possible that somebody got a bootleg I mean, you can get e-cigarettes from China online, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't touch it. So, you know, it is conceivable that someone became ill from smoking a contaminated classic, you know, I mean, a nicotine-containing uh, e-cigarette, but not, a, not um, ones that are retailed or anything like that. So do you think mm -hmm. it's overstated? I mean, we're watching, well, Juul just got bought by Well, this is, tobacco you company. have to separate out the, yeah, yeah, the two issues. Yeah, help us understand it. Help okay, us. so one issue is these deaths yeah. and, and the pulmonary illnesses, which I, I feel you can be confident enough in saying this is not a problem of commercial vaping products, um, nicotine vaping products. Mm -hmm. Uh, then you have the whole question of, forget that even happened, um, this whole question of um, kids vaping. Because for adults, smokers, that's who this, of course, this product is um, intended for. It was developed in 2003 by a, a, a Chinese inventor. And the first one in this country, I believe, was on the market in 2007 or 2009. Blue, remember Jenny McCarthy? Yeah. Um, and, um, and those were, they looked like cigarettes. They were right. called sigalikes. They're pretty lame. Um, they probably could be helpful if you weren't a really heavy smoker. But then the next gen two generations were um, things that looked a little more mechanical or uh, pen-like, you know, these. I big, got one once because I just thought it would be fun. And I couldn't even put it together. It was so complicated. <laughs> well, you, you needed, do have to. You go. needed a younger child to come and do it for you. <laughs> yeah, people go to vape stores. And, and, and there's like a lot large of thumb drives. Custom, like, yeah. that's yeah. tool. Yeah. Um, customization, and, uh, and that's where these flavors start in someone's basement. I mean, these were all DIY guys, or DIY guys, um, you know, trying to, who were, smoked and were dying to, to quit. They tried everything else, nothing worked. They finally so got a hold of quit. this. And but, but this has been such a it's major a godsend for these people, and an industry too. And I mean, it was really grassroots. I went to the vaping rally on Saturday. I mean, and there they were. And it smelled really good. <laughs> and, was, yeah. and, um, and, and this, now no one's saying e-cigarettes are safe. I was um, at, a, at a hearing a few weeks ago and the, um, the center in, or congresswoman in charge kept saying, but are they safe? Are they safe? What question to ask. The FDA doesn't deal with safety. I mean, in an absolute sense. That's an absurd thing to ask. I mean, is, is a Lipitor safe? Well, is some bike people riding, have is bad, bad reactions to it. No, and when it comes to 
Vaping in particular, which is a harm reduction strategy, it's always safer than cigarettes. That was all And it's point. had an effect on cigarette reduction, right? Oh, yeah. Plus, cigarette yeah. Uh, use is, now it was on that trend. There's no question about that. It's been coming, coming down since the 60s. But, um, but this has accelerated that trend. It did accelerate it in kids, actually, more yeah. than. Yeah, and, and, and reducing cigarettes for fruit-flavored vapes. Yeah. Um, yeah, smoking in kids is, is the lowest it's ever been, although it's measured on one monthly. So that could mean one God, every time month, I see but. kids are smoke I mean they're smoking or vaping. It's just But every, isn't that also it's it's a little bit like kids there were there was a you know social Oh they went up. There's no question. No, the, kids, the, the kids cigarettes went up and then you offer them I mean I find this, I'm sorry, a little bit evil. Mm -hmm. So then oh kids that are decline in smoking. So let's give them, you know, mango flavored Bubblegum flavor. The nicotine sticks that are safer than cigarettes, but it's still oh. encouraging young people to. Well, it certainly was ultimately yeah, unhealthy. intended for them, although Jewel in particular had some marketing missteps yeah. early on. Yeah. There's no question about that. I, actually, one of the if you want to read a good little cross section of sociology, I think this woman named Gia Tolentino in The New Yorker did a great job on vaping in high schools, which is a middle class, upper middle class white kid problem. Um, but there's no question kids are um, vaping more, and there's no question Jewel changed the landscape there. You know, it's, it's sexy, it's sleek, um, it is high dose nicotine, higher than most others. Um, that's not good, but mm -hmm. no one wants kids to vape unless they already smoked first. Um, and one of the biggest fears uh, was that it would serve as a gateway. And a, a gateway phenomenon is actually quite a hard thing to measure because it, what it really means is I wouldn't have engaged in behavior B unless I engaged in behavior A. When you just have a sequence, A and then B, you, you can't know whether one was pivotal. You just know that a person progressed and there may have been a, what's called a common liability, like re, uh, rebelliousness or risk taking or whatever. But in any case, the, the, the fact is that, as I said, um, smoking among kids is the lowest it's ever been. So that tends to rule out the idea that more vaping, you'd expect more smoking if it were a gateway effect. We don't see that, well, which is good. Well, vaping is replacing. I mean, well, no, it's introducing to people fear. who might never it's have not tasted a gateway. And at all. So the, the, the yeah. legitimate fear is just that it's well, for a young person, To go it's on dangerous. to smoking, which is very bad. Yes, are kids vaping? And I think Jewel changed this equation a bit. It's true. It, um, up until 2018, we have really good data showing that the kids who did vape regularly were already smokers or had already used hookahs and stuff like that. That may have changed a bit, and we're waiting for the data to come out from 2019, that there are more naive kids who probably mm -hmm. did start vaping with no prior. And that's not good. No one's defending that. Mm -hmm. But we can do both. We can... We can suppress access that kids have and make, I think we should be, I think the VA should be handing out vaping. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what they do at the National Health Service in England. They're, they're the mirror image of us. They promote smoking. They have they, vape they shops vaping. in their hospitals. Um, and uh, so we should do everything we can, give a massive insurance discount to people who vape while being much more aggressive and believe me, uh, the, the, the volume has been jacked up tremendously on, on curtailing access, kid, teen access, mm -hmm. which is right. We can even be more aggressive there. So teens, you know, down of adult smokers way up to the point where no one smokes at ever. And the irony, just the mind-bending irony of this is cigarettes are completely available. So the flavor bans that are now underway are going to send people back to smoking or to black market vaping. And a cigarette has like 7,000 yeah. dubious chemicals. So thank you for mentioning that. Yes, yeah, so I know you want to get to questions. So my last point is going to be um, when I said safer, and, and I keep emphasizing this relative harm issue, um, the, yeah, e-cigarette aerosol does have some carcinogens in them, many fewer than in cigarettes and some toxins. But at much so many fewer and at much lower doses, estimated by the Royal College of Physicians as 95%. Um, Others say, well, that may be a little too optimistic. Maybe it's 90. Maybe it's even 85. 85% safer. I, I'm filling that in. They say yeah. 95. But you know, still, that's that's, that's enormous. Lot. And if you can't stop smoking, that's a, that's the best way to go. Hey, thank you. Let's. We have a, a a question. Can you introduce yourself and then before your question? 
Welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Nicole Penn. I'm the program manager for the Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies program here at AEI, which Christina is a scholar in our department. Um, so I was just thinking, you know, historically, addiction in the United States is nothing new. We went through alcoholism in the 19th century, opium. Um, we, we seem to go through these peaks and valleys of of American citizens, you know, becoming addicted to a particular substance, and, and each period has had their own response. So, mm -hmm. do you think there's any, you know, lessons from history, or or do you think even just thinking about our history should perhaps calm us down a little bit about and viewing this as an as an epidemic, <laughs> or or just something that is part of the human condition in our society? Yeah. Well, actually, we still have alcohol. Still overrides everything, um, but we lose sight of that. Um, and yes, you're right, it's been going on. I guess the first opioid epidemic was um, epidemic. I hate throwing that word around, although I am not trying to minimize the extent to which um, there was a, a massive increase sort of after the Civil War, actually. And that tent peaked in around eight, 1880. Um, and uh, so yes, it's been going on and on. And in the most recent, most recent history, you know, we had heroin in the 70s, and then crack in the 80s and the early 90s, and, um, and the methamphetamine, not around here so much, but other places. And yes, drugs you will always have with you, because you always have human misery, and this is what people do. It's a response. And I think we, I think we have learned um, something. I do think, I mean, of course, you can find horror stories of uh, you know, people who've been treated really punitively. But in general, there's much more emphasis on diversion. In other words, people who are arrested uh, for crimes that are tightly linked to their drug problem. So in, uh, it, if I weren't addicted, I wouldn't be shoplifting from Walmarts. You know? um, now, I think you should still be held accountable if you're shoplifting from Walmarts, but it doesn't mean a jail cell. And I think this is great to be able to leverage the criminal justice system in a therapeutic way. So you're going to be in this treatment program. We're going to watch you. Mm -hmm. And we're going to test you. And, um, and we're going to give you more attention, to be honest, than you ever would have gone at a conventional yeah. treatment program. I, I wanted, we have one more question. Yeah. But I, I, I would want to hear more on the, instead of just throwing people in jail, like putting them into therapeutic yeah. uh, help. But, Ella Ryder is here, and uh, she has a question. Our Ella. Yeah, so I've heard people say that you know, in comparing the opioid crisis to the crack epidemic, that people only care about this issue because it affects the white working class. And I'm just wondering if there, there are any parallels between the crack epidemic and the opioid crisis, or if they're completely different and shouldn't even be put in the same bucket. That's a good question. That's what Dave Chappelle said in his special, like about the opioid crisis. It's like now you've got now it. Now you've got it. Yeah, you know, and don't worry, we don't care about you <laughs> either. <laughs> uh, there is something to that, and it just um, Nicole, I, one reason it got so much attention: people are dying. Uh, in uh, I mean, these drugs are more lethal. Uh, and they're often not used by themselves. You know, if you use it with Valium type drugs, you're going to increase the um, the Toxicity. lethality, and now we're in the fentanyl phase. I mean, we left the pill phase in about, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying pills aren't abused, they still mm -hmm. are, but, but that peaked in around 2011, and then heroin started taking off in 2010, and 2013, 14, fentanyl started coming in. That's 50 times more potent than, than heroin, and that's, I mean, you can't fight an overdose. You can't fight with an overdose death, although, although some say coroners aren't even that um, consistently good about identif you know, labeling certain deaths as due to um, opioids. But at least we know who's, who died versus who's addicted. The latter is much harder to measure. So yeah, I mean, there is something, there is something to this. Um, I would say the crack epidemic has lots of um, parallels to what's going on now, because any epidemic is a reflection of a community. And, uh, you know, and, um, you know Atlanta and 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 you know New York and um, you know Boston and all these I guess crack was oh in L A but um, that's all again ref reflective of 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 communities that are you know struggling so um, I think a number of things changed I do think. Um, I do think uh, it's probably more when when white middle class kids you know in high schools got affected that that create a lot of attention and energy, and that's really relevant to the vaping thing as well. 
And then, but a lot of things happened. I think that over time we were kind of um, um, acknowledging a sort of drug war fatigue. You know, what we're doing isn't working and a kind of weariness about incarceration. And these things all came together at the same time, I think, um, to lead to a, a, a somewhat, I would say a softer, definitely a softer approach. Uh, not perfect, um, not enough drug courts, not enough diversion, not enough capacity to follow people um, over a minimum of a year. I mean, a 28-day program is, is a joke. I mean, it might be fine to stabilize someone, but it's, it's to think you could go back out and resume mm -hmm. your life is, is uh, highly unusual. So, um, and that's another problem with thinking about it too literally like a disease. Mm -hmm. Because the idea of a disease, God forbid, we have a, you know, a thyroid problem, we get a medication for it or a surgery if we need it, it's over. Mm -hmm. This thing isn't over. I mean, recovery can, um, I have a colleague who's uh, almost a historian of recovery. He's, he's really um, amazing. Um, Bill, oh great, now I'll forget his name. Oh, Bill um, White, he has a great website. And he, he would say it takes five years before you could even consider yourself kind of recovered. And then you're always, you're probably always going to be at some vulnerability because your habit, you've established a habit that hopefully you've broken, but you still have a vulnerability mm -hmm. to reacting to stress with drugs. So you have to be a lot more vigilant. I'm just going uh, to, we have to wrap yeah. this up, yeah. but I would, I would just want to go back where we started with our book, One Nation Under Therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, and where we talked about PTSD, and at that time, it, the concept had been enlarged to include all sorts of cases that weren't really trauma. And now, what do you think about what's going on today? I just read yesterday that at uh, Northwestern, the new student newspaper had to apologize to the students because Jeff Sessions had come to speak, and they had done a report about it and taken photographs of the crowd. And, asked people what they thought, and the students were traumatized by the whole event, and they had to you know, issue this formal apology. Or at Oxford University, they voted that clapping caused, it could initiate trauma, and so now they have to have jazz hands. And I, I mean, they could be right, so no clapping when this is over, <laughs> please. Uh, have you heard about this? I mean, just this, the, the way we will take a concept and then get sort of panicky about it, Oh, and enlarge the meaning to encompass everyday life, and we're just pathologizing normal. Oh, I know. Well, of course I've heard about it. I'm your friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, in some, in some way, I'm, I feel I can always, um, uh, I'm always safe when I approach things as a, as a, I mean, I'm not a therapist. I don't have office. You know, I don't see people for 50 minutes. And, but I mean, obviously, still a, a therapeutic um, stance, you know, when I when see patients. And it's always, how is this helping you? How is this making you any more? I mean, fundamentally, I'm not talking about schizophrenia or, or you know, no, horrible medical con psychiatric conditions where medications are almost always necessary. Um, but you know, it is ultimately about freedom when you see a therapist. How can I not be locked in these bad habits? How can I stop sabotaging myself? And why would you want to limit yourself this way to be so afraid of everything and feel so vulnerable? That's, that just, under, just undermines yourself. So um, I'd be much better dealing with an individual, frankly, than trying to change a culture. Do you have any clinical diagnosis? Well, like we've speculated about opioids, but this campus... Um, Fragility and hysteria. vulnerability and hysteria. Do you have any, you have any insights triggering. into how we might <laughs> treat it? Well, that's we, what I was just saying. That's why I prefer to work at the individual level. Um, with methadone, it's well, easier. You have to have, I mean, one thing I can tell you is it's got to be modeling to some extent because to the extent that faculty put up with this stuff, you're going to get it. They didn't so just put up with it. They problem. theorize about it and encourage it. Then I it. think it's, a, it's a, going to be a very hard battle. Well, well let's give a, let's questions? give a, a we, do we have questions? time? Yeah, I, I, I have this fear that they're going to, they're going to come and throw us all out because we were told that they're, the room was booked at two, but if we're okay, we're okay. All right. We don't know what's going on outside that door. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> Maybe we should just but give Sally a round of jazz yes. hands. Oh, jazz hands. No, <laughs> lots of applause. Hands. Hands. Lots of applause. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Real thing. The PTSD from the war on drugs and the clapping makes you jump. <laughs> Actually, jazz hands makes me true. <laughs> well, thank you, Sally. Th oh, and thank, thank you, you all for coming. Thanks, guys. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Don't and say guys. Uh, <laughs> yeah.
it's it's Jesus. it's diminishing and 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 uh, psychologically destabilizing for women. Well, I have office hours. <laughs> I'm on the second floor, you know where I am. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, thanks for listening to the Femsplainers. Keep up with us on Twitter and Facebook at Femsplainers and on Instagram at Femsplainers Podcast. Send questions and comments to contact at femsplainers.com. A big thanks to Ella Ryder, our research and in-studio production assistant, and to Nat Fromm, our audio and video editor. And we're proud to be part of the Ricochet Network and grateful to the American Enterprise Institute for allowing us to record in its studio every week in downtown Washington, D.C. And miss something? You'll find everything you need at our homepage, femsplainers.com, including links to past episodes, where you can sign up to support us, and even to merch. And please don't forget to like us or give us five stars on iTunes. Thank Thank you. you. Cheers. Cheers.